afternoon. I'm Jennifer Schenker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, a publication uh, owned by Les Zeku, and I'm very happy uh, to be here today to talk about collaboration between fintechs and traditional financial services institutions. Um, immediately to my right, uh, I have Zach Paré, the CEO of Plaid, um, one of uh, the US's unicorns, and we'll hear more about what they do uh, shortly. Diana uh, Paradis, who is the co-founder and CEO of Suede Labs, which was named a 2018 World Economic Forum Technology Pioneer this year. Um, next to her, we, we have uh, Wim Mice, who is the CEO of the European uh, Banking Association. And last but certainly not least, Jacques Richier, the CEO of Allianz France. So let's get right into the topic. Um, today, most banks have some kind of accelerator or incubator program. Um, they might have even set up uh, an operation with beanbag chairs, a foosball table. Um, and then they turn around and ask the entrepreneurs that working there to fill out a 50-page form in pencil and fax it to the HR department. So how do we move beyond this kind of innovation theater to, um, to real collaboration between fintechs and financial institutions? And I'll start uh, maybe with you, Wim. Can you give us some good examples of, of real collaboration? Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. It is great to be here, and I think that Time is it's evolving incredibly quickly. Last year when I was here, it was still a lot of hype and instead of a lot of talk, but now you see really coming in together. Is it easy? No. What you say is ex fantastic. You get a PlayStation PS4 on board and you think you've got it covered and then when the new people come in and have to fill out 50 page HR forms, you're dead. But it is a little bit like um, a marriage or a relationship between an uh, an elderly, elderly partner and a young thing. Uh, you, the one wants to have tea in the evening and the other one uh, wants to go out partying. <laughs> Nevertheless, so it's what I want to say here, and this is what's important, there are very successful partnerships. Uh, we we um, had ING here yesterday, who has 160 active partnerships, real partnerships, but they are difficult. They require energy, they require understanding, they require culture. The regulatory environment you may have, what we like very much about fintechs is that they, the startups have brilliant ideas in parts of the value chain and then they enter in a bank. They get the bank's culture, but they also get the regulatory culture and the supervisory culture. So yes, um, there are some good examples, certainly on RegTech, uh, identifying um, uh, there is a Verif in, uh, in Estonia, for instance, that really nailed the uh, digital onboarding, and there are many more examples, but it is hard work. Jacques, let me turn to you. Can you point to some, some good examples in the insurance industry? Yeah, I will do it. Uh, just to come back to your first point, the 15 pages. And first, uh, let's take the view, our view. First, the thing is, how do we get in touch with those people? And that's why you were talking about accelerators, incubators. Mm -hmm. and the real point for us is how do we avoid to miss a good opportunity? Yeah. That's, uh, everybody should have that in mind. And, and how do we feed the system so that um, maybe they, they, they go through the 15 page, but at least we had a chance to meet each other. So in terms of, of collaboration, we have some good examples. Um, Otherwise, maybe you would not have invited me. But uh, I think we have to split the examples between just simple collaboration. To put it bluntly, I would say just um, supplier relationship. You have newcomers, you have the IBM and the others, and some people come with new technology and they want to test it with us. Mm -hmm. And we just enter into collaboration. Right. So, for instance, in artificial intelligence, that's really the case right now with us. And we have two cases that I could mention, which are uh, shift technologies and predictives. Mm -hmm. And really, it's how do we build things together. And they, we believe that they are ahead of, of the traditional competitors and that they could help us to move faster. And then we have collaboration where we use our tools through the accelerator or through the funds that we have where we invest sometimes in, in fintechs. We invest, 
and we collaborate. So it means that we go a little bit further because we believe in eventually in the future, in the technology, in the know-how. Maybe we consider that they could be a challenger of our business model and we want to invest in them. Okay? And we have also some, some good examples here of collaborations that we developed over the last years. Um, we invested and then we also try to develop business with them. Either on part of the value chain or it could be people who want to take, let's say, a broker view, to, to talk traditional way, so the, the chain between end users and us. Usually they talk about uh, client experiences, and sometimes client experiences means that they take this view that we have with the clients. Okay? So, and we, over the last, to give you a figure, over the last three years, we invested in 15 uh, fintechs. Okay. Um, and uh, we developed business with most of them. Some of them, we did not develop business right from the beginning because we did not consider they were ready for, but we, both of us, consider that for the future, they will be helpful for the industry and for us. Okay, so uh, let me ask, have you streamlined your processes? Because before, you know, when you were dealing with, like, suppliers, big companies, um, it's, it's a whole different ballgame than with, with startups. I, I was speaking here at the conference with uh, the founder and CEO of a, a European uh, startup that had a big U.S. bank invest in them. And uh, it, he told me uh, yesterday that it took two years for after the bank invested in them to actually roll out the product. And it took almost that long for them to be paid. And he said, you know, we were lucky we didn't get out of go out of business. And so, so you know, this is a problem for fintechs, this, this uh, onerous process, which on the one hand, you, you need to make sure that the product, you know, conforms to all the rules and that the bank or the insurance company isn't going to get into trouble. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, 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 when you wait that long, you, you, you risk to, to kill the startup. Um, uh, if I may directly answer to this, one thing is, in our pre-meeting, when you mentioned this, and you talked about two, two, took me two years to, uh, to get paid, one thing that is worry worrying for that bank is that you, I took me one guess to guess which bank it was. <laughs> and that says more about this, that bank than about the banking industry itself. Okay. Because I think that, that uh, in normal employment, normal relationships, you go by the contract. You pay people because certainly they're out on a limb, these startups. Having said that, the, the, on the other hand, on the culture, the regulatory environment, that is something that sometimes we need to, to help the startup understand. Because, yes, supervisors take time. Yes, there is all sorts of financial stability. And I think that in the development that you, that, that learning process, and um, I, my colleagues on the panel are quite good at helping us with that learning process, you learn from each other. On one hand, the, the startup learns that sometimes things take time because of the regulatory and supervisory environment. On the other hand, we learn how to streamline our process because we are challenged. All the processes are being challenged, and this is good. This is where it slowly moves. Okay, so let me, let me just turn uh, uh, now to Zach and, and then to Diana. So y today, you've partnered with 10,000 banks. You, you help um, services like Venmo and Robinhood to you know, work in the US, uh, all kind of apps that allow people to exchange money uh, easily and connect back to their bank accounts. How long did it take you to get the first deal with the bank? Um, so just for a quick context, uh, what we build in the US is the infrastructure that allows a, a consumer to programmatically interact with their bank account. Think of taking your bank account, wrapping a set of APIs around it, and then delivering that to the world. Um, or more specifically to developers who then make products on top of it. So yes, we work with Venmo and Robinhood. Also, Goldman Sachs opens all their bank accounts through cloud. So um, the, the first bank that we actually built the integration to took us about two and a half years to get anything live. And then the first true bank deal took us about four and a half years uh, before we were able to launch it. Um, and I think that's the, that kind of comes from two historical points. Um, one is uh, when, we, when we finished that first deal, so maybe two and a half, three years ago, um, the environment was very different. Um, FinTech didn't truly exist, or it didn't exist in the way that, that, that it does now, but it was also a bit of the chicken and the egg. Uh, FinTech needed Plaid to exist, or, or needed companies like Plaid to exist. Um, thus, FinTech could later grow, and, and, and now things have changed. It's become a lot easier. 
Um, so that's that's kind of one bucket. The second is that that in the U.S., where where Plot is based, and which is our primary market, um, there's a, a huge amount of regulatory uncertainty. And so though um, though our regulators have said uh, effectively. Um, open banking or open banking-like structures should exist. Uh, there's no teeth behind it. Um, and they were kind of waiting on the, the market to, uh, to do that, which ultimately has ended in a very good place. It just took quite a lot of time. So um, I would say startups that, that, that expect quick movement from financial institutions, they're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, and that's not to say there, there can't be a lot of innovation, um, but to expect that financial institutions will move quickly, um, that seems like a bit of a mistake. And building a revenue model that forces you to uh, not be able to wait for these two years to get paid. Um, well, many of our deals with the banks we've signed two or three years ago and are still waiting to get paid, and that's fine. Okay. Diana, you work uh, with banks. You help, you, you provide them with reg tech that helps them comply, but you also, I mean, you come from the banking industry and you have a good view on sort of mm. what are some of the issues uh, uh, that banks are, are facing in that that uh, fintechs face when working with banks. So please give us your point of view. So I guess that the, for us, the adventure has been quite, quite interesting because one of the reasons we've been able to, to grow this far without any investment is because we come from the industry. And I think one of the things I try to advocate more for the industry is that we do need a lot more enterprise software innovation. Uh, because in many of these conversations, it's basically that that we're talking about. The financial industry is very badly serviced when it comes to, to enterprise software. Uh, sometimes it's just really better versions of Excel, but it's not really what you would call proper good open tech, API-driven kind of architecture or the things that we really are requiring to, to take the financial industry to the next stage. And I, I would say that, you know, very much to, to echo Zach, there is a reality where it does take time. It is a, a long sell cycle for us. We, we had actually a client very quickly within our first year, but, you know, to get the momentum going, all of those things, they take a certain amount of energy. And again, it's very much just enterprise software 101. So the... I would say that the, there is a reality where from the startup perspective, you need to do your job to have a very concise value proposition that is very clear to the bank or the financial institution what you're going to be doing for them. And that's your job because you're selling your company. It's, it's your responsibility to make sure that you help whoever is your business sponsor help you. Um, but then there is another thing that we've observed in the past few years, mm. which is that the financial industry has been changing and there's been a lot more fintech teams and you know when we started you had some fintech teams at very large financial institutions maybe the smaller banks didn't really have it uh, but now most financial institutions will have fintech teams that are actually looking to really interact with the community um, and then the problem for the for the fintech teams within the organizations is that they're very often seen like entrepreneurs. So they're trying to push internally for an agenda and innovation that when they actually bring it back to, to the rest of the, the financial institution, nothing really ends up changing or, or moving. So I would say that there is, you know, the, the opportunity here is that, it, you know, fintech can really be seen as very cheap and efficient R&D. Uh, from a large financial institution, the reality that the way that a fintech can be building technology is just way faster than whatever can usually be done within the financial institution. If it's acknowledged for that, then there should be a lot more collaboration and a lot of support within the financial industry to work with these entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs effectively that come to innovate and bring better technology. So one of the things that you know, we have realized in the past few years is that actually sometimes going through the innovation guys is the least efficient way to actually access the financial institution when that's actually their job. So I would say it, it's a pity that that's how sometimes the, the realities are within the innovation teams. Uh, where they don't get enough momentum. And I would say that the, the innovation teams that we have found to be the most efficient to introduce us to the rest of the organization have actually been the ones that have sponsorship at the top. Uh, and it always really yeah. starts at the top. So if there is no direct way for those guys to push forward the, the agenda, it's just a hobby that the bank is having on the side of what they really should be doing. So what do you think, Women Jack? Do you think that uh, there is more awareness and more support coming from the boards and the C-suites of, 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 of large financial institutions, uh, more openness to working with FinTech? Well, I represent uh, a large number of banks, and there are differences. But the big ones, yes, you see that the successful banks that are converting, it's driven by the top, and I, I very much agree with this point on an innovation team. If you have a separate innovation team, this innovation team may help uh, together with the FinTech come up with something very, very 
innov innovative, but they run into a wall when they go into normal generation. And if you choose that model as a bank, you, you will somehow, if your, your fintech venture is uh, um, successful, you will have the problem of integrating that in your normal business. But before lunch, we had Frederico Dea here, who's clearly leading, who is looking at this entrepreneurship, who was encouraging his people to go for, to, to start their own fintech from within the business uh, without going outside of the bank. There are quite a number of IMG, where the, the, the Mr. Hamers, the CEO, is clearly driving. BBVA, Santander, BMP, so there is a lot of, there is a lot going on. Especially in the smaller banks, many of the smaller banks come to me and they're a little bit afraid of this innovation because their client base is mostly conservative, they're in a niche or in a region. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in my view, smaller banks, as there's so much technology available and there are actually so, much, so many good fintechs available, in my view, if, if the leadership has the right mentality they have the right strategy and their niche, and they team up with the right fintech, they can be successful. But I completely agree, it's the tone at the top that drives the innovation. Uh, just, yeah, uh, I fully agree with Diana. Mm -hmm. I think you are right. Um, it's, uh, it's true that in our case, it's not innovation team, but we decided it to call it strategy because we consider it's part of our strategy. Yeah. And those are the people screening the market, okay? But uh, I think it's not only turn at the top. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have managers. <laughs> we have many layers of managers. And those managers, there is a cultural issue. I take the point technology, for instance. They like done inside. So if I introduce you, they will say, well, in six months, I am capable to do something <laughs> that he is doing. Okay? And we, we enter into, uh, let's say, not fruitful discussions inside the, the company just to discuss why should we discuss that because it is very uh, successful and why should we lose some time, okay? So it's also a cultural issue and cultural issue is also on the FitTech side because of course the purpose of their life is to sell their product yeah. and the purpose of our people is to manage projects. Yeah. And your purpose is just one project among the others. And culturally speaking, that's where we have to find the right sponsor, I think you used that word, mm -hmm. the right sponsor to deal with the fintech, help the fintech to find the best path yeah. to go direct to the business and the implementation people that we... But there is a cultural issue that with time we will disappear, obviously, that's something. And we see it, uh, I'm talking about Alliance France, over the last three years, ch things have changed a lot. Always the, way th the way we are organized also changed. The way we deal with fintech changed over the last three years. Does not mean that I met already two, two fintech who, <laughs> who told me, you know, have, we have been discussing with you for the last six months and one told me one and a half year. Mm -hmm. So I said, either it means that there nobody told you but they don't want to work with you because it could be the case. <laughs> we have nice people and they say maybe one day yeah. we find <laughs> a good reason to work with them or Give me your, 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 your business card and I will check that you have the right sponsor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, we underestimated in our case the cultural gap. Mm. Uh, and that's very important. That's why we, we ask FinTech to come in, in our company to deliver speeches, to just tell what they do and, and make sure that all line of management are involved because otherwise we, 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 have, the, we have two things. It's not developed here, yeah. not invented here. The second one, I don't want to share it with one of my competitors, yeah. okay, which is, is an interesting case, but in many old technology, we shared it. Mm. So why don't we share it uh, like you are doing with other banks? Yeah. Okay? If it's successful, I mean, it's something we should grab before the others. That's where the competitive gap is eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think this cultural Gap and, and we should keep in mind, we are regulated, but regulated should not be the excuse. But it's part of the, what I call the process. And, and there is a process because we have to go through that process to make sure that we are compliant and we fulfill all the regulations that we, we need to fulfill. But should not be the, the excuse. I don't want to use it. Okay, I'm just saying that in large companies like ours, processes are part of the business. So 
<clears throat> I think that's a good segue when we talk about regulations mm -hmm. to talk about um, in, whether Europe's PSD2 legislation is something that is actually leading to open banking and more competition, or if it is being used as a um, kind of barrier to, to new entrants. Um, and Zach, I'll go to you with that. Sure. Um, well, maybe just to touch on the, the point that was being made in the previous conversation. Um, I think there's, there's, there's two sides of fintech that we have to consider. Um, one side of fintech is, yes, selling things to banks. Uh, and a lot of what we've talked about so far is how do we take a product that uh, a company develops and then sell it into a bank, allow the bank to use it and, and get value out of it. Um, the second is completely independent of the banks. Or I wouldn't say independent, actually, dependent on the banks. Um, but it's not about selling products to the banks. It's about uh, allowing a consumer to use an application, some sort of product outside of the bank, um, oftentimes relying on either bank rails or bank data um, to supply and, and empower that application. Um, and that's, that's the other side of FinTech where, frankly, banks have a lot more hesitancy. Uh, makes up a lot more questions. Um, ultimately, it's changing the model such that um, in, in the past, in historical days, banks were the only place that a consumer stored their financial data. Um, maybe they sometimes put it into an accounting application. Maybe they sometimes put it into their taxes. Um, but now today, we're in a world where um, consumers are increasingly using their financial data to do things that are outside the bank, be that pay someone, be that build a budget, uh, be that apply for a loan, or, or any other type of thing that you might do with your financial data. Um, and so in that context, we have to realize that, yes, banks might embrace fintech in the buying product side. They don't always embrace fintech in the uh, uh, enabling product side, or more specifically, the enabling consumer side, because ultimately it all goes down to the consumer. Um, just to touch on your question a bit, um, PSD2 creates an interesting paradigm. Um, it certainly was intended to encourage innovation, um, and in many cases, it, it, it has encouraged innovation. Um, but also, it, it does put the banks, in some senses, in, in the driver's seat of that innovation and gives them increased control over things. Um, for example, um, thinking about the, the user onboarding flow, the user experience that comes with that, um, with, uh, say, the OAuth APIs that, that some banks are starting to roll out. Um, if, you've, if you've spent time playing with these user interfaces, they're oftentimes quite horrible. Um, and in fact, it seems as if, and I, I won't say that this is true because uh, I don't think any bank would say this, but it seems as if many banks have built it such that um, it's, it's harder for a user to sign up than it should be, uh, perhaps even trying to discourage use of this or sometimes it, it not working at all. Um, and so uh, by having this regulation out there which limits the agency of FinTech by blocking scraping, and of course there's many issues with scraping, um, but it takes away the agency of FinTech to go get their own data and it says you will use what the bank gives you. And then the bank has the power to give something that's not perfect uh, and could use a lot of innovation, or it could use a lot of, uh, of work. Um, and so it actually does put the power then back in the bank's hands. And so it has this interesting paradigm of saying, we, we believe there should be innovation, and here's a structure under which there could be innovation. But then the reality is the innovation is stifled based on the availability of data from banks. Um, it, it's interesting to compare to the US, where the first step was there. The regulators made a very clear statement. We believe there should be innovation. Consumers own their data. They own access to their data. But then they stepped back and said, all right, market, go figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and while that was hard, um, ultimately, uh, it ended in a fine enough place. Um, there's still a host of challenges. Um, but it ended in a place that, that FinTech was able to control its own destiny effectively, instead of necessarily relying on the choices of individual banks as to what they could do. Uh, well, Plaid is um, thinking about maybe moving into the European market. So where does that leave you? Uh, well, I, just to, to clarify that. Um, we are uh, we're quite committed to our customers and what our customers are doing, and our goal is to enable our customers wherever they want to go. So that's not to say that we necessarily need to build something here. Um, we very well could do partnerships or whatever else it is. Uh, we need to find a way for our customers that want to expand to Europe uh, to expand to Europe. And there's a lot of fintechs in the, the U.S. that want to expand to Europe. Um, so I won't say that we're building something. Uh, we haven't we haven't gotten that far yet. We're we're in the uh, in the research phase. I think ultimately a, a lot of uh, our decision making here comes back to um, how fast we believe that fintech is going to continue to grow in Europe. Um, and we've seen that on the whole. Um, FinTech in the U.S., the, the, the amount of innovation, the speed with which you can get a product to market, the quality of those products, and frankly, the, the security and the infrastructure on top of it is incredibly high. Um, and as we learn more and more about the market, we see that there are certain pockets of that, um, but it's not consistent. And so um, our hope is that, you know, however we get there, we'll end up in a state where the FinTech market in the U.S. is chasing Europe. Um, 
but uh, we're not quite there yet. Okay, Tayan, do you want to comment on that? On PSD2? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how, I mean, PSD2, open banking, GDPR, all these new bits of regulation, I think it's always the same story. Effectively, it's regulation that comes out and it's very difficult for the market to figure out what the impact is going to be until it is implemented. Um, so I would say that from my perspective, you know, as a rec tech, and what we do is that we you know, take data and normalize it for the purposes of a regulatory output, whether it is uh, analytics or reporting or risk calculations, it, it doesn't matter. But there is a reality where the, the way the regulation comes out and the fact that it is not really thought out as a programmatic implementation is, I think, very problematic for, for everybody uh, in any sector. And it definitely is problematic when it comes to, to innovation. Um, you know, you take GDPR as a great case. It was really targeted to large tech companies, uh, but what happens day to day uh, is that actually SMEs are having a much harder time doing business um, and, you know, selling software and, you know, any young innovation fintech type company trying to sell software in a financial industry just because of GDPR, anything that's kind of cloud services oriented, it has become a lot more difficult. So um, my comment, I guess, on, on those bits of regulation as a rec tech as well, because we follow that very closely, is that we really, you know, we, we should be demanding as an industry more accountability for the regulation that's coming out and the realities of how it is implemented, the format in which it's coming out is something that is very difficult to calculate until implementation, what the impact is going to be on a balance sheet, what the impact is going to be in terms of the actual industry and innovation and, and all of that. So maybe a different format, you know, we're quite adamant and big advocates of data standards, publishing standards, uh, if anything in technology is made from standards in the financial industry, we need some of that as well. It's it's funny to 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 hear kind of people from Google and people in California talk about it, where uh, Google treats GDPR as really as a competitive advantage because they can comply with it easily, yeah. um, whereas mm -hmm. everyone else has to do exactly. a bunch of work to get there. But but that's the thing. GDPR is a great example. We had one of our clients told us that they have 80 percent of the companies they're signing up to uh, have been abiding to things like unlimited liabilities and and things that you know no. I mean, the basically, you ask who are the 20% who are not abiding to that, and obviously it's going to be more Google and large, large entities exactly. that can, you know, n basically refuse and reject certain procurement processes, which, uh, which the smaller companies cannot really afford to do. So we've yeah. heard about some of the pain points from um, yeah. the fintech side. Um, um, I, I think many, many important points were made just now, and, and Diana made quite a few. Uh, indeed, uh, GDPR is, uh, is at, in my family, it's funny because I have a Google Assistant at home and it is hilarious to ask it, um, hey Google, what do you do about my privacy? And then you get 30 minutes of explanation by <laughs> Google what they do about your privacy. And I don't even want to know because it's gone. So it's certainly true because now, Finta, if I take that as a serious point, the big techs come in here who use indeed the regulation as a competitive environment because they can easily adhere. But I want to go, and this is where, where one of the things where your question uh, to Zach is, is PSD2 uh, a game changer? It certainly sparked movement, but what I find, uh, and that's what I agree with Diana, is you ne always need to look at the history of European legislation. Because if you go back, uh, basically uh, PSD2 is the result of a discussion um, that was held uh, more than 10 years ago about multilateral interchange fees and changes in a closed banking sector. And look where we are now with uh, um, data platforms. And as well as banks always had data, but they always had them for payments. And basically, I always say banks had data but had no idea what to do with them. Yes. And now, mm. of course, we go to a new environment. And there is part, if we now look at PSD2, yes, it sparked things. Yes, it forces cooperation. But then, of course, the, the way you have to strike the balance is on one hand that banks need to be open for innovation. On the other hand, is that they also have a responsibility for financial stability. Uh, and cyber security, and that may never be an excuse, but that's why we need to work closely with rec techs and fintechs to know what these APIs should do and what we expect from each other. Yeah, I mean, I mean because it's clear that banks are still, uh, many banks are still learning um, about what, how to leverage the data that they have been collecting themselves for years, and I, I, I do remember moderating a panel a couple of years ago in Barcelona with a, a big uh, 
the Spanish bank and and a, a, a fintech who was doing you know split second decisions on uh, on loans, and the bank said to the fintech, well, where do you get your data, and they said, well, from you, because yeah, of exactly. course the users were allowing them access. And so the banks have been sitting on this stuff for a long time and not really doing things with it. So now, you know, that uh, we've moved on and the technology is there, the legislation is there, now, you know, we need, uh, more than ever, I would argue, fintechs to work with banks to figure out how to make the best possible use of this data to service consumers. Uh, you needed an integrated approach, and PSD2 was only one thing. And then when the commission came out with its digital single market strategy, both of us, we were all reading the digital single market strategy, was not a mention of financial services. So we corrected that by trying to writing a blueprint, and now it's all right. But it shows how limited the thinking among the regulators was on the possible environment. Mm -hmm. But, but just, it's interesting because in this panel we have the exactly what is happening to us. Yeah. I mean, s sort of the world is expanding, technology is expanding, offering new solutions mm -hmm. for us, but for our clients, changing the needs mm -hmm. of the clients, the behaviors of the clients. Someone, the question of the business, somehow the business model is questioned. And then we have expansion of regulation. Yeah. It's expanding world. Every two weeks you have something new. If it's not in Brussels, it's in France, but you have to deal with that. And we need them, both of them, by the way, because it's moving so fast that if we don't cooperate, mm -hmm. we may miss the point and we may leave enough space for really disruptors. Because I don't, maybe I'm naive, but I don't consider them as disruptors. I consider them as enablers to change our business model. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and that's where is the point. How do, how fast do we integrate them in our view, in order to change faster than our traditional mm -hmm. competitors or eventually newcomers, the ones that believe that and, and trust that they could change the full value chain. And and here, because if you look at what is changing our business model, you have two big topics of of what will change our business model. The third one, for instance, is ESR, but I don't want to tackle that. Mm. But these two, expansion of regulation mm -hmm. and technology, technology on the side also of the client's view, how behaviors are changing and how they, they will impact tomorrow our business model. Mm. And I, I thought that it was interesting that we had those two yeah. nice <laughs> FinTech here. So, so now I'd like to get back to things that both Wim and Jack had said earlier. So Wim, you had said, you know, of course, fintechs uh, and, and traditional companies have to work together, but it's really hard work. And, and Jack, you said, you know, uh, it's, and, 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 and Diana, I think, also mentioned, you know, how you need to have the buy-in from the top or it doesn't work. But it's the middle layer that is always the difficult part, the not invented here, the, the resistance. And part of it, is it not, there's just the way that traditional companies are structured is just not really um, very compatible with the whole notion of innovation, right? Because corporations are structured where, you know, people have to uh, contribute to the bottom line. They have to make their quarter. And when they develop a business plan for something new, they have to project, you know, what the revenues are going to be. But real innovation is very difficult to predict. You, you don't know what's going to come out. So there, there's an inherent tension there. And there's also, within big companies, a kind of culture of fear, right? If I if I sign off on this and it doesn't work, well, you know, am I going to get fired, right? And, 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 and yesterday, in the speaker's lounge, I was speaking to, to another, you know, fintech CEO who said it was horrible. He had to, you know, wait, uh, this was a, a year for every single department and division of this UK bank to sign off so that in case it failed, they could say, oh yeah, but Bob signed off on this yeah. too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so so how, how, how do you 
how do you get those two worlds to work together properly? And this is something I'd like to ask to all of the panel, like in, in terms of the, the, the partnerships or the deals that you've done, you know, what actually works? Because it, this is hard. This is something that not just the banking and insurance industry is grappling with, but every big sector when trying to work with startups. It's really, really hard. So yeah. what have you found that works? Um, you, for example, in the beginning, you know, I think a lot of the banks were looking at you a little bit askance, or like, are you a competitor? But now, you know, more and more, many of them think of you as partners. So how did you get there? Yeah, I guess to be clear, we, we never were seen by a bank as a competitor. I, that's f far too much of a compliment for them to give us. Um, but uh, more realistically, we, they saw us as perhaps the enabler of their competitors. So um, we, yes, worked with kind of the big banks, and Lending Club was also one of our early customers. And Lending Club made loans, and, and, and the banks make loans, so uh, there was some inherent tension there where we enabled Lending Club to make those loans. Um, but uh, I think to, to your specific question about how do you, how do you bridge that gap, Ultimately, you like bring it back to the, the lowest common denominator, the most important part, which is the consumer themselves. Um, and uh, the consumer having the ability to do the things they need to do in their financial life, having access to the data that they need, they need having access to the products that they need, um, that, that has to be um, the, the unassailable point where fintech and, and uh, large banks will, will agree. Um, and then ultimately, it's just a, a question of kind of orchestrating the conversation from there. So um, everyone agrees that the, the consumer is the, the highest priority in, in financial services. Um, the goal is to serve that consumer. How do we then build products that serve that consumer best? And finding a grounding point in kind of the consumer outcome or the, the change that you're trying to create um, is the most important part. I think when you optimize for things like profits or you optimize for things like recognition or brand or, or so on and so forth, at the cost of a consumer, um, that's when things get quite slow. Um, and what we found, especially in, in involving regulators in our conversations in the U.S., is that having that consumer narrative and actually having the consumers themselves speak that narrative uh, is incredibly important. Okay, Tanya. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think about the realities of implementation and, and working with financial institutions. I would say that the, the main thing I would love the financial industry to, to own up to is that it's extremely difficult to be agile within a large financial institution, even within a smaller one, because as you were mentioning, margins are, are very small, people are fighting for their jobs and to keep their jobs. And I cannot tell you how many times we start projects where you know someone in the C suite who buys us will tell us, we do agile, we, we do do it. And I'm like, okay. And I always <laughs> smile because I'm like, oh, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And then the reality is that if you don't have a team that can work with a startup or with a fintech or with a scale up or whatever you want to be calling us, um, you don't have a team where every single individual can stand up, do stand ups or scrums and make an actual decision on the spot, you're not doing an agile project. So when we started and you know, we've developed a whole philosophy around that and the way we implement our solution, we call it safe, is sweet agile for enterprise because we needed to still be agile because we are a tech company and we want to continue deploying and, and delivering in an agile way. But there is a reality within enterprise and within enterprise in the financial industry where waterfall projects is how things are done. So even if people start saying that you're going to start with an agile project, but then eventually it ends up like a very long list of tasks that never really pivot out of it, you're not really doing an agile project. And I think that you know, an, an admission of that and a reality around that is, is actually super important because if you really want to be agile as an organization, then what you need to do is empower your employees to make decisions on the spot. At that moment, when you're doing a stand-up or when you're doing a scrum or when you're having a catch-up for the project management of that whatever deployment you're doing, if you cannot do that, because in practice it's extremely difficult for a financial institution to do that, then do not call that an agile project and accept that you're going to be working with a, with a company that maybe operates in a very different way than you do whilst you have to also respect the realities of waterfall deployments, which is how the financial industry is very used to doing things. So the agile piece, I think, is quite important. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that it's very difficult as a model to implement in financial services. That's one bit. The other one is one of the first clients we had, uh, which was a challenger bank, uh, their model of taking decisions was you need to have at least two people to say no before something is stopped. 
<laughs> so it's kind of the contrary of what usually happens, mm -hmm. where you need just one person to say no and everything stops. But I would say that that was really interesting and it's something that I advocate a lot for, for you know, mentors and, and C-suite clients that we have. When they ask me this question, I'm like, just really try to change the way that people make decisions within your organization. Because if you encourage that kind of mentality and if you make it easier for people to say yes effectively, mm -hmm. you will have a lot more trial, right? So the, when I speak at clients, for, I get invited a lot to speak around you know, entrepreneurship and, and the realities of the feedback loop that you know, MVPs and POCs and, and all of that generates. To be an entrepreneur and to do a startup, you need to, you need to really learn fast and fail fast and cheat. Right? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a culture that accepts failure, where the risk and the consequences mm -hmm. of any project failed is actually losing your job, that's just never going to change anything. So an environment that allows, you know, I don't know, whatever you, you want, maybe sandboxing, or where POCs are maybe sponsored out of the innovation team, whatever it is, there is a reality where we need, as a financial industry, to welcome failure as an opportunity to learn things. And it cannot be this whole black and white situation because a lot more reality of innovation is actually very great when it comes down to implementation. Great, so now I'm gonna ask both Wim and Jack to answer the following. Um, you mentioned earlier, Wim, you know, uh, one bank mentioning they had like, I don't know, 150 uh, trials going on. I, I have heard uh, from people who've spoken to me, frankly, about the industry that uh, a number of big companies are, they have 100, 200, 300 proof of concept trials, but they know that not a single one of them will ever really be implemented as a product project. So do big companies need to be more, um, more focused on, you know, what is the outcome that they want? What, what do you think, you know, uh, what do you think is the right model going well, forward. Well, there, there are several ones, but uh, a few points also on what Zach and Diana said. Uh, first, there's no doubt, speaking for the bank industry, the customer wants instant and 24-7. So whatever a bank wants, whatever its culture is, it will need to deliver on that, however it does, because its customer base and its expectations are completely changing. Then I've seen, and this is the interesting part of my role, you get to look into the kitchen of quite a number of banks and you see different approaches. I've seen banks go completely agile, trying to, but then a few problems. First, I have yet to see the first agile central bank. That will never happen. <laughs> uh, you second, never know, you never know. Maybe. I, uh, well, <laughs> this is one of the things that I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but I'll buy you a drink the moment that happens. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I've also seen banks go agile, but then uh, leaving out their compliance team and then making accidents because the compliance tribe was located elsewhere. Thirdly, it is still a profession, and we have recently seen a challenger bank who had r wrongly classified its risk rate as assets for 300 millions and lost half of its share price. Mm -hmm. So there is still, there is still, it is, and, and this is one side. So I agree with Diana, ba banks are, cannot be fully agile because after the crisis, banks are still fighting with their role in society. Their reputation is low. Mm -hmm. So when an accident happens with a bank, it immediately leads to headlines in the newspapers mm -hmm. and uh, questions in the parliament. So, and this leads to a kind, and this is on one hand, your customer wants it and wants it now. On the other hand, your regulators and your politicians want you to be extremely careful after the crisis. And it is this balance that leads to this sign of culture and the, and the nervousness in banks. Mm -hmm. So that's one. So what's the right model, you asked me? I think that what you described is exactly the wrong model. You have banks who use their buying power to basically buy all the fintechs with that they see, put them on a shelf, and these things will never happen because the smart people who develop them will leave the, the company and it will just die. I think that if you have that approach, and that's right, I know bank or banks who do this, I think that's the wrong strategy. For me, the cooperation model is indeed in creating, we've talked about culture, we've talked about sponsorship, but in a clear cooperation model where it needs to be either you part, take part of the value chain and you really have to go and maybe that part has to be separated and has to really work agile, but then you also need a plan on sponsorship and who you're going to operationalize. 
um, uh, that is for me the best model. But it requires a cultural change. And again, I, I, there are a number of banks in Europe who are on that journey, and in my view, these will be the successful ones. Okay. Shaka, uh, final word. I think um, as soon as you get the image that you are capable to listen to those people, you have many fintech knocking on your door. <laughs> so the point you mentioned is true. You, you may be, if you are a nice, nice company, you say, okay, let's try a POC and let's test it, okay? And, and then nothing happens because you do not have time. So part of the, of the learning of the last years was to screen, but also to be very vigilant. And when we were testing, just to test on a few cases. And to focus on some technology, for instance, in our case, I guess uh, banking would be the same thing. We consider uh, AI is, yeah. is, is really something that will change the business. So yeah. let's focus on that and data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second thing, I, s I, I said, the point you are, it's, you are mentioning somehow is sense of urgency. And that's what we are, I am saying to my people, sense of urgency because the world is changing. Customers are changing, and tomorrow we may not meet again. I mean, we used for the last 150 years to have chats and to discuss and to meet through our offices, whatever, and all of a sudden, no contacts anymore. Okay? That's sense of urgency. But we have the same thing, sense of urgency on regulation, yep. sense of urgency on financial cri crisis, and things like that. So the peop I mean, the employees, at the end of the day, they say, okay, sense of urgency every morning, it's, it's really boring, this thing, okay? <laughs> so we have, no, we have to make sure that we, when we talk about that, we talk about a bright future, something which is not the traditional sense of urgency. Yes, we have to move fast, but we have to move fast because we do it together, and we have to learn from each other. That's what we are working on. And I am talking about the culture because it's really a cultural issue. And, and because I believe in Darwinism, that's what I tell my people, it's not because you are big that you will not fail, yeah. obviously, okay? But it's not because you are the new entrant that you will succeed. Because Darwinism is applying to everybody. Yeah. It's, it's because we co-create together that we both may have a chance for the future. And that's how we should work together. And that's, I think, a great point to end on. Um, there's lots of things to work on together. Progress has been made, still a lot more to go, but, uh, but a, lot of, um, a lot of good projects that, uh, that may, uh, may come out of, uh, of all of this. So with that, please join me in uh, giving a big hand for our panel.